Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page. And then get immediate feedback against the radical prostatectomy. 300 cases, track your progress, earn CME points, visit mripro.io. My webinar, uh, which we're bringing to, to, your day, to you today uh, with a couple of uh, new special guests um, on the session today. So my name is Jeremy Grummet. I'm an, a urologist and an associate professor at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of MRI Pro, uh, which is an online training program uh, for reading prostate MRI. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by MRI Pro and especially designed for urology residents. So a little bit of a different spin uh, today. Uh, and it's been very kindly in endorsed by um, ESRU and YOU. Um, but we also hope it'll be useful for um, anyone who wants to learn how to read prostate MRI, whether it be urologists or radiologists uh, or trainees. Now, before I introduce our panel, um, I just want to show you a very short video, which will give you an idea of how uh, MRI Pro, the online program works. So just bear with me for a moment. I'll just play this video for you. Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page. And then get immediate feedback against a radical prostatectomy. 300 cases, track your progress, earn CME points, visit mripro.io. All right, it's just to give you a little teaser of what the actual program uh, can offer, but you're gonna get much more of a flavor of that um, as we go through uh, various cases uh, today. I might slip into saying tonight every now and again because it is seven o'clock here in Melbourne. Now we are thrilled to have two uh, expert guest panelists uh, on the panel today. Um, we've got Professor Roberto Miano, um, who's Professor of Urology um, at University of Rome Tor, Tor Vergata, uh, well known for his work in training uh, for prostate MRI and also transperineal biopsy amongst many other things across urology. Uh, so thank you very much, Roberto, for joining us today uh, and for spreading the message online about this webinar as well. Thanks, thanks for the invitation, Jeremy, Andrew, and Richard. It's a nice pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Roberto. And we're also joined by Dr. Francesco Esperto, uh, who is the current chair of ESRU. Uh, and he's been very kind to involve uh, ESRU in this session. So we really hope it's, it's very useful for all the residents who are tuning in. Um, he works at the Campus Biomedico University Polyclinic in Rome. Um, so Francesco, it's great to have you along. Uh, thanks a lot. It's really a great pleasure to stay here. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks for the great opportunity for all residents in urology across Europe, but across the world, because it's really an intercontinental event. So really, thanks a lot. It really is, actually. And we've got um, uh, over 750 uh, people who have actually registered for tonight's event or today's event um, and for from over 80 countries, which is just fantastic. And that's uh, wow. also very much thanks to Roberto, you and Francesco for spreading the message. Now we also have our regular uh, stalwart panelists uh, in Associate Professor Richard O'Sullivan, uh, who is a prostate MRI expert. He's read thousands of cases uh, and was one of the first uh, people, certainly in Australia, to um, become an expert in prostate MRI. Richard, thank you for joining us again. Pleasure, thank you for having me. We, we won't be seeing Richard's face today because he'll be sharing his uh, images uh, on the screen. And finally, uh, again, we have Dr. Andrew Ryan, um, who's an expert uropathologist who works for Tissue Path, uh, which is a uropathology service uh, here in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and he provides the beautiful images you're going to be seeing um, depicting the actual uh, prostates in volumetric studies and so forth. And Andrew will, will run us through um, how all that works. So Andrew, thanks again. All right. So today, as usual, we, we're going to be going through three or four cases and time permitting. Uh, we'll also be dis discussing some issues that relate directly to how urology residents get trained uh, in both reading prostate MRI, but also then applying that skill um, in performing targeted biopsies. Um, so we'll also hear about some in very interesting initial survey results uh, from Professor Miano um, that he sent out in conjunction with this session tonight. Um, I also want to let um, people who are tuning in know that um, MRI Pro has a shorter version called MRI Sprint uh, that, that you will have uh, read about in the uh, promotion of this event, uh, which is made up of 30 cases. So MRI Pro is 300, MRI Sprint's 30. 
Uh, and at the end of this session, uh, we'll be giving you some details um, for all of you who attend uh, today as to how you can get free access uh, to those 30 cases. So uh, I think uh, the only other bit of housekeeping um, is that uh, we have, as I'm sure you're all familiar with by now, the Q&A function. Now that we've got a lot of people uh, attending today, or we've already got uh, about 200 online right now. Um, but having said that, please feel free to uh, type in some questions um, if you wish. We'll try to get to them. Obviously, I can't promise that we will. Uh, and um, uh, we shall get the ball rolling. So Richard, if you're happy to uh, load up the first case and I'll give a little bit of clinical background to it. There you go. There we go. So um, just as you're loading that up, Richard, this is um, a 63 year old man uh, who presented with an elevated PSA of 7.0 uh, that got repeated a month or so later, and it was 8.1. Uh, and as a result, and as is typical in our practice, uh, the next step was a prostate MRI. Richard. So there's a lot of images on this page, and I've done this to show you how I set up, how I look at it. So we won't look at all of them uh, in detail because there's too many images to look at, but we use a, a Siemens 3T uh, Skyra machine. Uh, we actually have four of them, which we report off. We do about 2,500 cases a year. Uh, we don't use an endorectal coil um, uh, for the last 12 months or so. Everybody gets a, uh, a bowel preparation prior to the procedure. We do a three-plane T2, so there's a sagittal T2 in the top left-hand corner, axial T2 and a coronal T2. And then we do two uh, diffusion wave images uh, that's in the top right-hand corner. This one here is the ADC, and the top right-hand corner is the high B value, which we set at a B value of 1400. And then we do the same thing in the sagittal plane, uh, the, the ADC here and the high B value in the bottom right hand corner. This last image is the DCE. So this we use a wash-in technique and we overlay the wash-in over a T2 way image to give us a color depic depiction. So the, probably the easiest way for us to look at them is if I put these together in a slightly easier way to look at. Mm -hmm. So just bear with me for a sec while I just make these big enough for us to see. So um, so the anatomy, uh, well, let's just go through that very briefly. So on the sagittal, uh, the T2A image is um, uh, fluid is white. Uh, so the, uh, the easy way to recognize that is look at the bladder. So we've got fluid in the bladder is bright and white. Uh, this is the seminal vesicles here, uh, paired structures, uh, post row superiorly, transition zone centrally, peripheral zone peripherally. Uh, on the axial images we can see here, this is the tra transition, transition zone here centrally, which is really com uh, composed of a series of al alternating bright and dark lesions. So there's sometimes they're well-defined and uh, dark and sometimes they're bright. The hallmark is a well-defined margin around it. In broad, in broad uh, detail, the, uh, there's about 30% of tumors are in the transition zone. It is the harder area for us to look at. Uh, this is the anterior fibrous stroma here, and it's surrounded by a peripheral zone uh, peripherally, which holds about 70% of the cancers. So we're allowed to have lines are normal. That's a pyrads too. Uh, Ill-defined wedge-shaped area is also normal. And then we go to the ADC, which looks a bit like a poor quality T2. Again, we look at the T2. Uh, it's a bright fluid on the, on the, in the bladder. On the ADC, it's a bright fluid on the bladder. And it looks like a poor quality. So the, uh, a T2, the the transition zone is areas of darkness and brightness and the peripheral zone normally is bright. Whereas the, the high B value, it's, a, it's almost a reverse of that, uh, where the, uh, the urine in the bladder has gone dark and the peripheral zone has also gone dark. So what happens is we increase the B value, we're really looking at cell density. So the higher the cell density, the more likely they are to be cancer and they'll be bright on the high B value and they'll also be dark on the low B value. So black and white, black on the ADC, bright on the ADC is the thing that I used to say that it's going to be a, a clinically significant lesion. So if, let's just uh, go through these now. So these are linked together. I've, we're just about to link them together. And if we go from the base, we can see bladder here. Uh, this is probably a central zone here. As we go through peripherally, uh, uh, we see the uh, transition zone here, peripheral zone here. And what I'm really looking for is a focal area of decreased signal intensity on T2. 
or ADC or an area of increased intensity on high B value diffusion imaging. So if we look at this area here, it's a focal area of restricted diffusion. That is to say it's black on the ADC and bright on the high B value diffusion in the transition zone. So to interrogate that, I've got to see what it looks like on the T2A images. So you can see on a normal transition zone, it's a homogeneous area of decreasing intensity with a black margin around it. And this looks the same, but it's got restricted diffusion. It's bright on, and as we, as we go further down, it gets brighter. We can see it's dark on the ADC here, bright on the high B value diffusion imaging here. And it's a little bit blurry here. The margin is not quite as clear as it should be. But if you look at the same area on the sagittals, it's almost got a black line around it. And if we look at that on the coronals, it's almost got a black line around it. So, but if you've got asymmetric restricted diffusion, you have to interrogate it very closely. And I find the sagittals are very useful for that. So if we look, if it was an atypical, if it was a BPH nodule, BPH nodules should be round or oval. And you can see here, this is irregular and it's the incorrect shape. So if it's an asymmetric area of restricted diffusion and it's not round in the transition zone, it's going to be either a pyrads four or a pyrads five lesion, depending on how big it is. So we've got this measured as two centimeters in size in this prostate that's 50 cc in size. So this is a pyrads five lesion, although it looks almost like a pyrads two lesion on the T2. So the diffusion is also very important in the transition zone as well as the peripheral zone. But the, in the transition zone, the dominant sequence is the T2. Right. Right. That's. I was just gonna. I was just gonna make that comment, Richard. Is that um, according to Pyrads, you, you, even though visually you you could argue that you can see it more obviously on the diffusion weighted images, it's still the T two which has to be the dominant series, isn't it, for for transition zone? That's definitely true in Pyrads. But what I would say to you is that if it's asymmetric and irregular, that's a very that's a very strong marker. Even even though we can see a well defined margin at least on part of this lesion on two planes in T2. Now, so it fits, it fits the sort of pyrads 2.1 of an atypical BPH uh, um, a nodule, but it's got marked restricted diffusion. So as we keep on going, if we, as we keep on going, we can see there's a second lesion here in the anterior peripheral zone at the right apex. So if we look at the, on the axial, diffu the axial diffusion angle, you can see that it's dark on ADC. It's not very bright on high B value here. So the reason I actually do a second plane is it allows us to visualize particularly the apex and the base. And if we look at that lesion on the high B value here, it's actually very high. So that's a that's a part that's, I've got that measured at 0 0.7 centimeters. So we've got a combination of a pyrads five lesion at the base and a pyrads four lesion at the apex. Now, what, I, what I'm finding very interesting about this uh, discussion so far, Richard, is that the only series we've looked at so far are T2s, ADC maps and high B values. I know we've looked at it both uh, sagittal and axial and even a bit of coronal, but I'm, I'm bringing this up deliberately and I'll be interested in, in what uh, Roberto and Francesco think here, but we've got a question in from Russia um, saying, what do you think about biparametric MRI? So I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but um, it is interesting that you know, you've already basically made a diagnosis of two lesions um, and we haven't yet looked at DCE. So uh, I, obviously I know your thoughts, Richard, but if you could express them and, and then I'd love to hear from Roberto and Francesco about that. Well, let's just look at this. In this patient, we have, a, we have the subtracted images. This is the raw data, which I put in the bottom, line, bottom corner. And the, the, the color that I showed you earlier is a combination of this subtracted images overlaid on a T2. So if I put the marker on this, it doesn't demonstrate any, any increased uh, enhancement. Uh, and if, if I put the color marker on the one in the diffusion in the transition zone, it maybe does. But the, but it's really only the the, the the DC is really only useful as a differentiator in the peripheral zone. Right. So uh, and if I if I go back to the uh, this image, you can see at the base we can't really see that lesion. And at the apex, we can't see that lesion. Yep. Now we did we did talk about how it's all about 
we don't see every every picture we don't see every lesion on every picture so to me it's a combination of all the pictures together mm. it's not a perfect test it doesn't get it right 100 percent of the time so i every little bit that i can get to help me that's what that's how i look at it and sometimes if i see it it's much more obvious on the dc than elsewhere it makes me go back and interrogate the other images more closely to find a correlate roberto what, what do you think? Um, uh, what's your general practice uh, in Rome? Are you always using multi-parametric, which is still the standard? Roberto? He's muted. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I was mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, in Rome, we use uh, multi-parametric MRI for uh, most of the patients, very few biparametric. We, we are now starting to, uh, to try to find some patient with, uh, with, that does not need of contrast medium during the, 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 uh, during the scan. But and, uh, it's a great pleasure to see that uh, uh, you use a digital plane uh, when uh, radio the, the, the scan. I, I used to do every time because uh, it's very easy for me uh, to locate the lesion in a three-dimensional plane, and it's also useful for my uh, prostate biopsy. So it's uh, probably transitional zone is the most difficult case to review, uh, but uh, I understand perfectly that the combination of all the sequence made uh, the, the, the right pirates in, in, in this case and in all the cases. Yep. Francesco, anything else to add? He's on mute as well. There you go. Yeah. Uh, in my hospital, we used we used to use a 1.5 Tesla multiparametric MRI. And uh, we, we used to do, usually, before to perform a prostate uh, fusion biopsy, we do a kind of a MDT with the uroradiologist to look at uh, the MRI. And we usually prefer to repeat MRI in our hospital rather than to keep MRI coming from others. Overall, if they come from little center close to Rome, because, you know, a lot change, not only for the machine that, that you use, but also from the center, from the experience of, uh, of radiologists uh, performing uh, the MRI. So what happened here often is that uh, Pirates 5 or Pirates 4 at the end, looking at them, it was not anything. So if we have any doubts, we prefer to repeat the MRI here and after in case to go for, for fusion biopsy. And Francesco, were you finding that in the less experienced radiologists that um, a lot of the time Pyrads 3 was getting reported as a kind of a bit of a sit on the fence report or not so much? Uh, Pirates, yeah, is, is a lot to report. It's probably uh, more than uh, what it is overall because there, I think there are legal reasons so that when you have any doubts, you prefer to give a Pirates 3 rather yep. than uh, to give uh, nothing. And yep. uh, also the other thing that we noticed is that uh, really few radiologists give 3A or 3B as a classification, just probably because they don't want not uh, you know, to give indication uh, for to go or not to go yep. for biopsy. Biopsy, yep, yep. All right, um, well, we better keep Jeremy, moving. Jeremy, you, you would biopsy pyrate 3, wouldn't you? Yes, I would, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, the literature would suggest that uh, pyrates 3s are at least 50% positive for significant cancer. Um, now, again, it depends on who's reading it. Um, but in our experience and, and our own data, um, it would be at least 50%. So, yes, I would... Or almost always biopsy pirates three. I would say I'm I've been doing I'm only an MRA also. It's the only thing I do, and I've been doing it for 25 years. And this is one of the hardest things I've ever had to learn. Interesting. Yep. So that, that's a well. You've never said that before, Richard. I, th I think that's a fascinating comment, and I must say it's it's pretty much the whole reason why we we do these webinars because. It's not like looking at a plain X-ray and just going, oh well, there's the stone. It's uh, it's really nuanced and complex. So um, let's uh, have a look at some more nuance and complexity. Andrew, um, this fellow went on to have a transperineal biopsy, um, including targeting of those two lesions. Um, are you able to yeah. tell a report of that? 
Yeah, so there's his um, his prostate biopsy. So he's got extensive disease in the fact that he's uh, he's got five of his six target uh, sorry uh, template sites, and both the right anterior and left anterior target are both positive. Um, so his tumor foci range up to you know they're relatively small. They go up to three millimeters, um, with small percentage pattern four in uh, multiple sites. Yep. Okay. So both targets positive, um, and but as you say, very low percentage of Gleason pattern four. So just sneaking into ice upgrade group two. Um, and relatively small as well. Like, as I said, three millimetres, you know, that when we know once we're seeing a radiological lesion, it's usually bigger than that. So I'll ask our uh, urologists that these, um, uh, these cases um, of very low end grade two um, prostate cancer, PSA less than 10, um, on the biopsy, would you do any staging of this patient next or not, Francesco? Uh, it, uh, usually I, I ask uh, at least a CT scan for everybody. I will not ask probably um, a bone scan for this kind of patients. What I used to do also is to always calculate uh, the Brigantine nomogram. And uh, in this case, we have an MRI, so we could use the update Yes, we're going to be nomogram as well. Yep. Uh, but yes, I usually ask a CT scan for everybody, so chest and uh, abdomen, and uh, I decide to ask for a bow scan according uh, with, uh, with the risk of patient. And so in this case, probably not. Okay, yep. And do you have access to PSMA PET? So in Italy, we have, I think, three centers only that perform uh, PSMA uh, PET. Uh, I asked uh, up to when I work here just uh, for three patients, uh, PSMA PET. Usually, honestly, not at this stage. We ask it uh, if you have a, uh, a PSA raising up after a prostatectomy or after to see if there is any uh, nodes involvement uh, after uh, radical treatment, uh, but not at, at this stage yet even because, as I told you, it's not so available. So you should exactly. yeah. make people move from uh, kilometers and kilometers uh, to get uh, a PSMA PET. Yes. Is that your experience as well, Roberto? Yes, we, we, we work in uh, MGT with oncologists and radiotherapists, and we decide to, to do a coline PET uh, for all the patients with uh, 4 plus 3 and more uh, prostate cancer. In a patient with 3 plus 3, uh, most of the time we do nothing, especially if the PSA is less than 10. And in this case, with, uh, with a low intermediate risk, uh, we probably we will do a CT scan uh, in order to uh, understand the situation at the level of lymph nodes and uh, to, to better define the treatment of this, uh, of this patient. Okay. But PSA may is very rare to have in uh, in Italy at the moment, uh, as Francesco said before. Well, we're so very in Melbourne, sorry, yeah, sorry, Richard, Melbourne's a city of about between four and five million, there'd be over 10 centres, well over 10. Yeah, so we're very lucky. We've got we're a lot of plenty of access to PSMA PET and we, we pretty much use it as a standard. However, really only um, as a standard for the higher grade, so high intermediate or high grade prostate cancer is a routine. Um, a fair bit of doubt as to its utility for the low intermediate uh, grade prostate cancers. Now, this, this patient clearly has only just low intermediate, so he didn't actually have any staging. We went ahead and did a robotic radical prostatectomy. And Andrew, um, you should have the pathology there. You might give us a quick explanation of, of what, yeah. what it's about. Yep. Um... There we go. So I'm just going to divert just for, I know everyone's here to, to learn about MRIs, but um, just so that we can have an explanation of uh, how uh, Richard's such an expert, um, we, uh, tr we try to provide this visual um, demonstration uh, from our radical prostatectomies. And so I think, you know, we've, uh, Jeremy's run a, an MRI uh, MDT for, for many years now where we present our MRIs and then the, and then these final uh, pathology. So it, it's certainly been a very good education tool for all of us. Um, so just before we progress on, I'll just say how we come up with these. Um, take a, 
uh, resected prostate. Um, it's inked and cut as it would be in most uh, pathology centres. And we cut these um, in the uh, transverse, into transverse sections with the apex and the base uh, serially parasagitally sliced. So we end up with a specimen that looks something like this. The reason we parasagitally slice the apex and the base is to make sure that we can assess the full margin at the base and the apex. And then for these middle transverse sections, we're really interested in the radial margin all the way around. Um, so from there, these get, uh, some centres will use um, whole mount slides, but it does take a considerable additional processing time. So we cut those into quadrants um, and they're processed and put on slides. And when we read the slides, we actually mark out the tumour uh, and the tumour foci. And then following uh, our reporting, using that template, we then reconstruct these. We scan the slides and reconstruct them and designate where the uh, the tumour foci are using that colouring in that we've, uh, or the outline that we've used. And we designate orange as the index tumour and any other foci as black. Um, and they should correspond, um, you know, to the report that's given as well to say, you know, we designate an index tumour and then the other, other tumour foci. So for this particular gentleman, um, this corresponds, you know, really quite nicely to what Richard was showing, this um, transition zone lesion, larger transition zone lesion that extends really from the base down to the mid, but then uh, it's almost like um, a, a dumbbell type appearance because it's got another bulge down towards the apex. And I think that was what he was seeing radiologically um, on the, at the apex as well. So um, I've just outlined that just again shows what we're doing when we outline the focus. Um, so this really quite cellular tumour here with benign glands over towards the side. So this is an anterolateral um, quadrant. Uh, and so most of the tumours, these well-formed glands, um, Gleason pattern three, but small percentage pattern four as well. So that index tumour is um, bilateral apex to base transition zone three plus four and other smaller tumour foci. Margins are negative. We designate those also on the picture. Margins are negative and... Uh, there's no evidence of extra prosthetic extension. Thank you, Andrew. We've got a question um, from one of our attendees. Uh, do you mark the location of peripheral zone on the pathology volumetric studies? No. No, no. You did. Um, that's, that's an interesting idea. Is that something you've thought about doing? Uh, look, I think, you know, when we see diagrams uh, with central zone and peripheral zone and transition zone, uh, they're always made to look, you know, perfectly anatomical. But if we did that, I think we'd end up with a messy picture. There's often not a clear demarcation. And uh, especially if you have BPH as well, it bulges in. And so I think it would just add, an, uh, you know, add a level of complexity that was unnecessary. We certainly designate in the report whether those foci are transition zone based or peripheral zone based. And I would probably suspect that's enough. Okay. Um, I've got a... a I'm keen to answer some of the questions that are coming in because I do want to try and make it as interactive for our audience as possible, but um, I I'll obviously won't be able to field all of them. But one of them I think is worth fielding. Um, Richard, this is for you. H how do you deal with very large prostates with a lot of BPH nodules, some of them with diffusion stricture? How do you sort the cancerous from the benign in that scenario? Um, I've got an analogy as a Van Gogh patient of Starry Night. So you want to look for the brightest one, the brightest one on the diffusion is the one I will interrogate the most. You'll find most of them will be a similar colour or a similar degree of brightness or darkness. It's the standout one that's the most important. And I think most of the times, I'm, I'm interested in what Andrew says about this, but I think those very big prostates, they usually have a cancer in the peripheral zone uh, and it's small and small and peripheral. So it's a bit easier for us. It's all, it's again, I think where the colour comes in useful because it just, it, it's a, it allows you to look at another part that you wouldn't normally look at. So, um, and, I, and I think you'll also say that the, they are less common in the big, in the big, big, big prostate cancers. Yep. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the, I use the same principles. Okay. But they're small and peripheral in general. All right. Um, any other comments from anyone else at this point? There the is only thing I would say is that you've seen from that pathology that we underestimate the disease. And there is a question on there saying that uh, they'd love the pictures to review the MRIs. Well, you can let them know that the, all those pictures are on the MRI Pro. So they are there as the gold standard to review your MRIs. That's true. All the pictures are. I, I'm not sure if he's referring to 
having a peripheral zone demarcation or, or just the pictures. But uh, no, oh. that's exactly right. Actually, I what it does remind me... The, um, <laughs> no, the pictures are fabulous. Um, tell me, uh, Roberto, do you... I mean, we've been talking about this feedback loop that we're providing here with Andrew's pathology. You then look back at the MRI and you go, oh, that's just a beautiful match. You know, it really... Um, drives home uh, how good MRI can be when it's properly reported. Do you regularly have MDTs with your trainees that will assess this and, and go back and, and look at that? Do you have pathology which is pictorially represented? Uh, not, all, not always. Sometimes we, we, we do. We, we are starting now a new program of uh, a structured training on uh, uh, before an MRI then on truss and then on planning biopsy and then on to do biopsy uh, using using the, 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 the this fantastic software I think and um, we are trying to do more and more this uh, very interesting uh, uh, way to learn and uh, but at, at the moment not always we we we, we do we do the same but uh, I'm now starting this new program with uh, the resident at the second and the third year uh, in order to increase the accuracy of the resident to uh, reading MRI, yeah. to do a, do a good planning, to do a good trust and to do a good biopsy at the end. Now that, that leads into your survey really because you, you know, you've just um, conducted this online survey as part of this session, excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, what were your what were your initial findings, and how, how many people responded? Yes, it's very very interesting. We we decided with Francesco to do this uh, this survey uh, starting this week, and uh, uh, we receive at the moment 122 uh, responses uh, from uh, uh, most of the, most of the uh, resident uh, replies from Europe. And uh, we receive a very interesting findings in terms of uh, uh, using MRI. Most of the resident, about 80% uh, uh, of the resident, uh, always review the MRI before biopsy. But they have no a great confidence in reading and interpret MRI. So they, at the end of the survey, they ask for uh, help in terms of learning of new learning opportunities, about 95% of the residents uh, ask for new learning opportunities in MRI, and they ask for uh, to insert uh, an MRI reading and interpretation in the urology curriculum, in mm -hmm. urology training. So I think it's very, very uh, interesting uh, findings, and that, uh, and I, invite all the people that didn't reply at the moment to to use the survey monkey links uh, that you see at the moment on the on the screen uh, to join the the, the, the survey but uh, uh, we need to um, to go in depth on these uh, on these findings because uh, uh, they need help and yeah. uh, the reason that uh, all of these people today joined this session uh, i think is a, is a resident ask for help in uh, reading and interpret MRI in order to do a good biopsy and in order to uh, give a good treatment to the to the patient. I, I couldn't agree more with you, Roberto. And I think the other aspect, and I'll be interested to hear what Richard thinks about this as well, is that it's, it's obviously radiologists clearly need to be able to be expert in reading prostate MRI, but like all other urological imaging, whether it's ultrasound, CT scans, even plain X-rays, you know, as trainees, we all went through and we had to know how to read all of those types of imaging as routine. And that was just standard. And I think it, the same should be absolutely true for prostate MRI, considering how massively widespread the testing of it, the use of it is going to be or in, and is already. Um, and also Richard's comment to say that, you know, this is one of the hardest types of imaging that he's ever had to Get, come to grips with so you can imagine that there's a there's obviously a huge unmet need here and that's well, it's really what MRI Pro but also these webinars that we're doing is trying to fill that so um, this the survey monkey uh, link is on your screen but we have already sent it to you um, anyone who's registered for this session so please go ahead and fill it out if you haven't already and um, and that'll be even more helpful for us to um, get your thoughts on that
But to give you some idea, as I said, we do about 2,500 patients a year. There's really only two of us that's, that report them. And the second person who reported them, I didn't let him report them until he'd reported 1,000. He co-reported 1,000. So it's quite, it is quite a learning curve, I think. Yeah. And, it, and uh, it's not done at all well uh, at multiple different centres. Uh, people do it every now and then. Uh, so I would say if they're doing one or two cases a week, they're probably not going to get be very good at it. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on to the next case because we've got a couple more to get through. Um, so Richard, if you're happy to put up case two, um, this, is a, this is a 70 year old man um, who had only a slightly elevated PSA 4.4. Um, interestingly, this guy, um, we also did a prostate health index on, um, which is not that commonly performed in Australia. Um, I'm not sure whether you use it at all in Europe, uh, Francesco. Um, but um, 71 is elevated. Normal PHI would be said to be up to about 45. Is that something you use, Francesco? We used to use it a bit more before some years ago. Now, not uh, anymore, even because PHI is pretty expensive and not available everywhere. And honestly, MRI is, stating, is taking the place of uh, PHI and uh, other marker for... Uh, usually, uh, we used to use it after a negative biopsy when you have a serious suspect for cancer. So before to go for a red biopsy, we used to ask for PHI, pro PSA, all this kind of uh, of marker. But no, I don't, I don't use, I don't use to to ask it a lot, honestly. I don't yep. know, Roberto. Yep, Roberto. Yeah, no, 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 not not at all at the moment. Yeah, no, it's kind of dropped off a little bit here. And again, I think I agree entirely. It's probably because MRI has kind of superseded it. All right, what have you got, Richard? Okay, so um, I the first thing I'd say, this is a 30 cc prostate. So beware of the small prostates because that's often where they things hide. So as we're going from the uh, base, the apex, anterior fibrous stroma transition zone, peripheral zone. Uh, as we go further down, we see this homogeneous area of decreasing intensity here. Again, it's almost got a peripheral margin to it, that black margin. It's in the anterior transition zone here. And as we go further down uh, towards the apex, so the anterior peripheral zone has an anterior horn at the apex. So this is really involving the transition zone and the peripheral zone as it goes down towards all the way to the apex. And you can see also that there's, the capsule is bulging and it's discontinuous. It's strongly, the T2s are the best one to look for for the extra capsule extension. The previous patient had no extra cap extension. I'd be very suspicious this had extra cap extension. If we look at this picture on the ADC bottom left-hand corner, it's dark and it's bright in the high B value, so black and white equals cancer. I've got this measured at uh, two centimetres in size, so it's a pyrates five lesion, a small volume prostate. To give you some idea, I think the sagittals are quite useful to show you how super inferior this lesion goes to. It goes almost right from the base to, to, towards the apex, not all the way, but most of the way. Uh, the, uh, the color again, it doesn't really enhance uh, focally with contrast. Um, so that's how I reported it. And it can be a very, this can be very humbling, uh, this test. Uh, and because you can see there actually is a second lesion, uh, which we see on, which was not originally reported. If you look yeah. on the sagittal high B value images, it is here. So it's bright on the high B value, the sagittal T2. It's quite hard, it's hard to see on the T2s, but you can see it here and here. Uh, and that's also dark on the ADC and does not enhance with contrast. So in retrospect, that's a PARADS 4 lesion, but it was not originally reported. So you can see, again, the complexity. I mean, this is even... Uh, reported by an expert of thousands of cases. Now, having said that, you could be forgiven for missing that one because it's pretty small and subtle, especially there's probably, I wonder, Richard, if, if you'd agree that sometimes there's a bit of a uh, attention um, effect where if you do get one big obvious lesion, it, it I mean, I know that you're trained, all radiologists are trained to, to look for more lesions, but I wonder if there's a bit of a bias there that once you've found something and it's obvious, then it may sort of take the heat off finding other things, which you do have to keep trying. That's absolutely true. You have to, don't stop at one, you have to keep on going. Yep. If I just look at the colour for just one moment, you can see that's the high, on the high B value. And that's the, there it is on the colour, on the subtract image. So you do see it. So you do need to look at all, all the different images to be sure. 
So, Francesco, what sort of biopsy would you do for this chap? Uh, honestly, in our center, we use just a transrectal. That is a little limit, uh, I guess, of, uh, of our center. So we just perform transrectal uh, fusion biopsy. Uh, probably, I, I go for a transperineal in, in, in this case. I didn't see how anterior it is, but... Yeah, it's pretty anterior, yeah. but it's not a big gland. So it's probably not going to be hiding behind the pubic bone too badly. Can you see that? So it's, it's very anterior. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So would you, would, you, would you, do you think transrectally, because I, I haven't done transrectal for a while now, do you reckon you'd be able to hit that with a transrectal needle? If that's because far it's anterior? It's the prostate is, is small, probably you'll be able to to yep. arrive there. Yep. And I presume, are you talking about cognitive uh, targeting or you talk, do you use a software to fuse? No, we use a software to fuse. Okay. And would you take template cores as well or just target cores? No, 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 no. I always perform target plus systematic biopsy. Yep. Yep. And, and one more, I'm peppering you with questions here, but um, with regard to transperineal, you mentioned that you know you're mainly doing transrectal. Do you foresee, or do you think that in the near future you'll be able to access transperineal more easily, especially now that the people are showing that it can be done under local anaesthetic? Of course, honestly, uh, you know the other thing that will give a lot of space, I guess, to transperineal is the possibility to perform a focal therapy as well. So right. when a center is going to start to perform focal therapy, they need to uh, prepare themselves to have an access, a transperineal access. So at that time, I think the best thing uh, for every patient would be that you could be able to decide if to go transrectal, transperineal, with the coaxial access, with the template access, just to choose a biopsy for every single case. So to be able to change your technique according to where the lesion is. Right, right. It's very interesting that you bring up focal therapy um, because um, we, as we'll, we'll see um, further as we go through when we, when we look at what Andrew uh, shows us, um, obviously if you do focal therapy, then you really need to be very sure that you've just got the, the one focus or at least that you know where the focus is. Um, Roberto, just getting back to biopsies, um, how do you train up your residents in performing biopsy and what do you use? Oh, as, as you know, Jeremy, uh, we did transperineal biopsy since, uh, I, I believe, 30, 30 years. Uh, and, my, and my boss, I, they, they told me they, uh, they started in 1982 to do the first transperineal biopsy. Uh, all, all of our biopsy is in uh, local anesthesia, total free hand at the moment. Um, we use uh, between 2010, 2015 uh, for five years a fusion system, but uh, we did uh, uh, find any advantage of fusion system on uh, then the connective. So we start again a, a, uh, every time a cognitive uh, uh, biopsy. And uh, again, we uh, train our trainees in doing prostate uh, biopsy, especially focusing on the parallelism of the probe and the needle, uh, working on, uh, on, on, the, on this point that is the crucial point of the of tr transperineal biopsy. And uh, especially in, uh, we, we find, especially in the anterior uh, biopsy, a great advantage of transperineal than, uh, than transrectal, uh, using sometimes a two-point access uh, on, the, on the skin, on the perineal skin, but when we have a big process, sometimes we, we move uh, uh, more anterior on the, on, the, on the perineal skin to do uh, a four access point uh, uh, technique. Yeah. Uh, this is okay. especially uh, important for anterior lesion. Yeah. And uh, in, in anterior lesion, I, I used to say to the trainees uh, to go straight to the, to the lesion and, uh, and to use, uh, if, the, if the lesion is lateral, if the lesion is pyramidian lateral, to, to go uh, on another access point of the skin to go straight to the, to, the, to the lesion and not to enter 
more paramedian to go lateral in this case. Right. right. Yep. Yep. And how do you how do you think um, how easy do you think it is for for trainees to pick it up, or do you think this is quite a challenging skill to pick up? For the transperineal or the anterior anterior mapping? Both. Uh, so transperineal, I think uh, they need uh, about uh, uh, 30 to 40 biopsy to have a good expertise. And this is the reason why uh, I will start uh, early in 2021 uh, to use a precision point, a, random a randomization study on with the use of the precision point uh, in order to see if the learning curve is faster in uh, in resident uh, uh, with precision point or without precision point. Yep. Uh, this is the crucial point. For ant the anterior mapping, I think is not too difficult. It is uh, the, the best way is to uh, exactly go at the level of the of the of the of the, of the lesion straight to the lesion, uh, and not to uh, to use uh, uh, to force. Uh, on, on the probe or with the needle to go anterior, uh, starting from the posterior uh, access point on the skin. So uh, it, it's not too difficult to, to go anterior, uh, but it needs expertise. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, thank you for that. Um, now- I'll just say one thing about these images before I look at the path. Yes. Um, this lesion, it's dark on T2, it's yep. dark on ADC, and it's bright on high B value. Should you biopsy that? Well, it's wedge shaped, isn't it? And it's, yeah, so and that's, it's a, that's the central zone. So if you see that triangular shaped lesion in the posterior midline in the upper at, upper half of the prostate in the midline, that's the central zone, it's right. normal, normal anatomy. It looks like cancer. Yep, okay, thank you. But uh, do um, just fix your eyes on where that lesion is. Um, and Richard's already shown you where that other much smaller spot was down to the right uh, anterior apex. Now let's have a look at uh, the biopsy. Now I, I asked you specifically about biopsies, guys, because um, I do typically do um, a target and template. Um, now there are some people I know who are not so keen on doing the template, but certainly the guidelines would suggest that the standard at the moment is to do both. Um, that may well change in future, but for, for now, that's that would be my standard approach. So this is what we found. Yeah, so there was the little surprise that um, that we saw retrospectively. Um, so the target biopsies and the right anterior and left anterior biopsies have got up to 12 and 11 millimetres um, with small percentage pattern four. And then the right posterior template biopsy has a, a focus of higher grade pattern four, grade group two up to eight millimeters. And that corresponds to the lesion that, that Richard had seen. Yep, sorry, I meant, yeah, right posterior is the additional lesion. So um, based on that, um, we went ahead and again, did a, a robotic radical prostatectomy. And that, uh, here's the, the larger lesion that was uh, evident as anterior right and left transition zone extending down from the apex up into the base with extra prosthetic extension as Richard had anticipated. And this smaller lesion down towards the right apex, which is designated the index lesion. Um, this is the low power. These are the parasagittal sections of the apex. And so our lesion, that index lesion is down in here. You can see benign glands even on low power. And then this more cellular area and on, uh, you know, zooming in on that, you can see these larger um, dilated benign glands closely packed, these closely packed glands, glomeruloid structures, fused glands. Um, so this is the pattern four component. Um, so three plus four, 40% um, was that eight right apical lesion, the index tumor, and up to three plus four, 10% in that anterior uh, lesion. This is fascinating. So there's more, there's more percentage pattern four in that much smaller um, posterior apical lesion, which wasn't originally seen. Now it is visible, but um, you know, you brought up focal Francesca I think this is just really illustrative that if if uh, we are considering focal therapy and I'm and I'm I'm running a focal brachytherapy prospective registry here in Melbourne at the moment so um, obviously very interested in this space but it does show you that um, you, you've got to be pretty confident that you're not missing uh, significant cancer elsewhere in the prostate if you're just targeting one lesion and and that obviously speaks to uh, having expert MRI uh, reporting but it also 
uh, probably mandates, uh, I think, some uh, template biopsies as well. Two things, Jeremy, I'd like to ask. So the first one about focal therapy, uh, my experience is uh, with uh, TUCAD, so it's not a proper focal therapy, but it's uh, more an ablation of the lobe of prostate. Gotcha. Yep. It's just probably because of the issues that you mentioned that you have to be pretty sure where the lesion is. So in this case, you have the chance to go wider, okay? And to leave the space that you need to spare the nerves and the continents, okay? Yep. So this yep. is the first thing. The other thing I'd like to ask you for the MRI interpretation. In this case, we had a lesion really pretty close to the capsule, okay? And for us, as urologists, it's pretty important to know if we have a clinical invasion of capsule at MRI because it changed our clinical stage and changed also the nomograms to decide if to go for a lymphonodectomy after when you perform uh, the radical prostatectomy or not. So the question are, do you routinely report a capsule involvement at MRI? And after I saw from the final pathology that capsule was, there was invasion of the capsule uh, from what I saw. So knowing that, would you go for lymphonodectomy? So this changed your scores and changed probably surgical indication. So how yep. do you, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So, well, I, I mean, Richard always, uh, we will always report whether there's extra prostatic extension or not. Um, and then in terms of whether it changes my um, treatment, um, I, I must say that I would be much more swayed by the grade and the volume um, rather than the extra prostatic extension. And, and based on the biopsy results um, where there was very little pattern for, um, it, it didn't prompt me to do a lymph node dissection uh, in this patient. And, and, I, and I, would, I would stick with that. Um, I, I mean, I happen to know that this patient is now two years post and PSA zero, but um, it's certainly worth bearing in mind um, because, yeah, it can, can certainly affect what you end up actually doing as, as the treatment and whether you include a lymphadenectomy or not. Uh, this index lesion is clearly separate of the capsule, uh, but the second lesion, the one that was reported, is clearly does breach the capsule. Yep, yep, it does, yep. So this but, is a clinical T3A, right? Yep, yep, that's right. I wouldn't that's, necessarily routinely do a lymphodistinction on that. An eye risk. Well, Jeremy, no. Go on, Roberto. Oh, sorry, Jeremy. I, I, I'd like to uh, come back on, on the planning on biopsy in this case. Uh, in my practice, in this case, I will do uh, a three to four core for the anterior zone, the bit the larger zone. But when, when we have a very small uh, lesion, I used to do a saturation of the target in that lesion. Smaller is the area, the suspect area, more is my uh, biopsy from that area. Uh, so this is what I start to do in the last... Uh, uh, in the last year, so the saturation of the target when the lesion is very, very small, and uh, uh, three or no, no more than three or four when the lesion is big. Yeah, I totally agree with that uh, logic, Roberto. And and you know that obviously that's because the smaller ones are so much easier to miss. Um, and you know, just a little bit of needle deviation here and there can uh, can make it hard. So and and there's good data supporting that, that to do at least three cores, as you say. Um, per target lesion. But yeah, there's not much really point in doing more than that for the big ones because you're going to get all the information you need out of, because you know you're going to hit it. You, if it's large, you, you, you can easily get smack bang in the middle, but those little ones can be tricky. Um, I do have a question that's just come in, um, which does pertain to this case, because Richard, you know, you showed us, I think, um, how visible this spot was, in particular on the DWI or the high B value sagittals. And um, the uh, attendee has asked, do you do sagittal DWI as a standard protocol? Yes. Yep. And that's not, that's not mandated by Pyrex version 2.1, is it? But, but it's just something you, you find extremely useful, don't you? Yeah, so Pyrex uh, mandates you should have a high B value of 1400 or above uh, in the actual plane, but not a, not a second plane, no. But we yep. do it as a routine, yes. Yep. Okay. 
All right, um, let's keep going. Um, we've got uh, two more cases if we can possibly squeeze them in. We do have a large audience. We still have 240 plus participants. So um, if you do have a few spare minutes, uh, Francesco and Roberto, uh, it would be great to hang around, but uh, understand if you can't. Um, all right, so let's do look case at case three or case four, Jeremy. Let, let, let's do case three, because it's. Um, I think we'll be able to uh, show it really nicely. Okay. So case three is a 67 year old man um, who presents with a particularly high PSA despite being on Duodart. Um, so we know that obviously if you're on Duodart, you should be basically doubling uh, what the PSA is to get a real reading on it. And his was 12.7. Um, so he went on to have this MRI. I'm just uh, linking those. So again, this prostate is a little bit bigger. Uh, I've got this measured at 100 cc. So it's uh, against our, uh, it's uh, uh, most of the other ones are zero in a much smaller prostate. You can see the, uh, I thought it was linked. We'll go through, the, we'll go through the, the transition zone first. This is a very good example of what normal transition zone look, looks like. Well-defined mm. margins, well-defined margins here, alternating black and white. Uh, but all nodules are uh, have got a well-defined margin. So just bear with me while I link it again. So as we go from the uh, base uh, to the apex, you can see uh, initially, you can see easily on the high B value, right from the base in the post-olateral peripheral zone, uh, you can see there's restricted diffusion with increased signal intensity on high B value decreased on the ADC and decreased on T2. And that really goes all the way to the base. If we looked at uh, the apices, I'm sorry. And if we looked on the sagittal IB value diffusion energy, you can appreciate mm. it's the, the, the uh, seminal vesicles are here. It really goes from the tip of the seminal vesicles to the base. Um, if you look at this most superior location here, this is where the seminal vesicles are. So I wasn't sure whether the right central vesicle was involved or not involved. Uh, if we look on the sagittals, this is the central vesicle here. It's, it's right adjacent to it, but it's, I'm not completely sure whether the central vesicle is involved on the right. But I am sure that the, there's extra capital extension. If we yep. just go back to the T2s are by far the best one to look at that. So you can see if we compare here to here, this is the capsule as we come around on the left-hand side, the capsule should be somewhere in here. So this is a obvious extra capsular mass. The subtle extra capsular extensions we have typically on MRI, but this is not subtle. This is very extensive. Uh, this is the recto prostate angle here. It is a bit different to the other side, but most of the time when you reduce that angle, the, the cancers are here rather more peripherally here. So I think this is a pyrodes 5 lesion. I've got this measured at 2.3 centimeters, uh, dark and uh, bright. Uh, with definite extra capsular extension and possible right seminal vesicle invasion. There's a question, Richard. Uh, just you mentioned uh, lesion size there. What series do you measure lesion size on? Well, Pyrad says you should do it on the axles. I, I do it whatever's the biggest one. <laughs> but for what Whenever series? I say the biggest, that's what I call because we know we underestimate the extent of disease. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but T2, do you mean, or? Um... Well, which, no, whichever is the biggest, I put yep. it on. Okay. And oh, sometimes the biggest is actually on the DCE. That's not uncommon. Yep. Uh, and, uh, or on, on the, uh, the post-contrast one. So that's, I sometimes use that as the uh, measure. Now, you mentioned on the report of this one as well, and this is uh, obviously going up a level, but you've talked about the possibility of a lymph node. Yeah, that's right, right iliac area. Okay, let's just go to... I'm not sure if you've got the T1s, uh, whether you need them. What series would this you is it here. use? This is the one we're talking about here. So we'll just go to this. And then we also do a coronal T1, which is a volumetric study. So what, if, what series do you like best for looking at lymph nodes? Uh, I, look at the, I look at the T1s. Yep. Uh, so you can see here, so we might have been, uh, it's, a, it's a volumetric T1 we use. So um, this is the one that I was concerned about here. Uh, we can see here on the axial T2s, it's oval and it's less than a centimetre. So there are two criteria for me to say it's probably not going to be pathological. So they're much more likely when they're small, if they're rounded, to be pathological, but we really only start to be useful when it's over a centimetre. 
Uh, so we can see it here in the po right posterior internal iliac group here. Yep. Uh, I find the sagittal is very useful. So this is common iliac here. Uh, this is uh, obturator nerve here. So this is the, I call this the obturator group in here. Uh, common iliac, external iliac, and the posterior internal iliac is here. And that's where this lesion is. So it's a right posterior internal iliac lymph node. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say it's it's possible. It's indeterminate really because it's it's not quite big enough and it's not yep. quite round enough. And it's got a little bit of restricted diffusion, which uh, I'll go back to the high B on, which helps you a little bit. You can just see it there. Okay. So I'd, I'd call this possible, but not definite. So in the interest of time, we might skip the biopsy report, Andrew, and, and I'll come back to that in a minute because we'll look at the radical. Um, but out of interest, um, I then went and did a PSMA PET scan uh, as the staging uh, because the biopsy came back as Gleason 9, which is a grade group 5. So I just want to share with you uh, what the PSMA PET scan looked like. So just bear with me for a moment. I'll quickly get that up. I can find it. Okay. So um, just to give people who may not be so familiar with PSMA PET scanning, uh, what it typically looks like, you've got a whole lot of normal uptake in kidneys, spleen, liver, bowel, um, salivary and lacrimal glands. So that's what we're seeing here. We're even seeing a little bit of uptake coming down the right ureter here. And of course, radio tracer in the bladder here. But um, beautifully uh, shown is that ex exact same lesion that we saw just on the MRI. So it's showing up the primary extremely well uh, as well. And of course, there's data showing that PSMA PET's pretty good for primary um, uh, diagnosis as well as staging. But I just wanted to show you what that looked like on a PSMA PET. So basically, despite that equivocal node on M MRI, there was no such evidence of avidity within any nodes uh, on the PSMA PET scan. So I went ahead and did a, uh, a radical prostatectomy, including a lymph node dissection. So... Um, Andrew, have you got the... Yep. So that was the, the biopsy results, as you said, 4 plus 5, grade group 5, uh, 4 plus 5, uh, grade group 5, with uh, lengthy involvement of multiple cores. And by the way, that's this is not uh, what I would typically do nowadays, um, because it goes against what you just said before, Roberto, where I took a whole lot of cores from the target, but, uh, but that's all I did, whereas now I would take just a handful from the target and then do a template as well. Uh, so beautifully demonstrated on the MRI and shown here is this uh, elliptical lesion at the right posterior lateral angle extending from the apex up into the, or just below the base. Um, uh, and then this is the posterior lateral quadrant section. You can see these uh, benign glands over towards the right hand side of the screen. It's very cellular um, and with extra prostatic extension, even on low power, we can see the extra prostatic fat which is bulging or is certainly present still here, but I think most, uh, there's a considerable bulge of the, the capsule, but there is definite invasion of the fat as well. And this is a high grade lesion, grade group four in these areas. Um, so four plus five overall uh, with mixed acer and ductal type with extra prostatic extension, but margins negative and 13 nodes negative as well. So there we go. I've, I've done a, you know, an extended pelvic lymph node dissection as well and no nodes found or no positive nodes, I should say, out of um, 13. So um, this guy recovered very well. His PSA went to zero postoperatively uh, at six months, still zero. Uh, and then uh, at 12 months, uh, it's, it moved up. And in fact, it got up to 0 0.36. Now, again, if you don't have access to PSMA PET, um, you're, you know, there's not too much imaging you can do that's going to be particularly effective. But um, I did do another PSMA PET scan um, to see uh, if I could find out what was going on. So I just want to share that with you because this is quite an interesting case. So just show you this, get rid of that. So this now uh, was the, the PSMA PET when his PSA was 0 0.36. And what you can see here, I hope, I'll just put it on slideshow. Uh, again, you've got a bit of tracer coming down the right ureter here, but there are two quite clearly positively avid right iliac nodes there above the level of the bladder. So they would have been outside the operative field, but they may well 
correlate, in fact, to that original MRI, potentially, Richard, that, um, that you reported on in terms of location. It does look pretty similar. Um, now, from a, a management point of view, and I'm not sure, um, if Francesco or Roberto, if you guys are doing this, um, but I referred this patient for stereotactic radiotherapy, external beam, to, uh, to these two nodes, uh, which was uh, delivered by my radiation oncology colleagues. Um, that was 12 months ago, um, and his PSA remains zero, and he's not had any hormone therapy at any stage. So this doesn't happen all the time, but it does show what can happen uh, sometimes, at least. Now, he's not out of the woods yet, obviously. It's only 12 months, but it's a remarkably good result to date for Gleason 9 that was clearly lymph node positive. Do you do any uh, radiation to oligometastatic disease? Yes, that, that, that's the that demonstration of the role of multimodal therapy in patients with high risk prostate cancer. And uh, we usually uh, discuss all of these cases in, during our MGT meeting and use, uh, in this case, a stereotactic uh, uh, radiotherapy uh, because of the role of different therapy in, uh, in different stage of the, of the, of the uh, disease. Uh, so I, I agree totally with you in, uh, in this situation, but I have two questions to, uh, to one from, uh, for Andrew, one for Richard. Uh, for Andrew is uh, when you report a, a radical prostatectomy, you report the Gleason score at the level of extra prostatic extension or not. And for Richard is, uh, which is the best, uh, the main point to, uh, to uh, define, to assess an extra prostatic extension uh, with, with MRI? Well, my answer's quick, Roberto. Um, we, I give a grade uh, score at a positive margin if it's present, but not, at a, not for the extra prostatic extension. Uh, let's just go back to this case. Um, uh, so most extra prostate extension we see is actually quite subtle, uh, one to two millimetres in radial dimension and too small for us to see on MRI. So what I, offer, what I typically report is the length of contact with the uh, capsule. So for example, in this patient, the length of contact would be of the order of 2.2 uh, centimetres. So that puts them in a, a quite a high group of being highly suspicious for extra capsule extension based on that alone. But this patient's got more than that. So I, the first thing I look at is the length, the length of, uh, uh, the length of, uh, it abuts the capsule and whether the capsule is in continuity or there's a focal bulge. So we can see on the other side here, there's a black line that goes all the way through here. The black line disappears here. And then you have to imagine a bit where the black line would have been. So the black line would have been somewhere in here. So there's clearly an extra capsular mass in this situation, but the extra capsular mass is actually quite uncommon. We don't, we don't see it as obvious as this very frequently. I yeah. would agree that, that that's really obvious. That's a, that's a large area of extra prosthetic extension in that pathology picture I showed you as well. And so when we've discussed this at our meetings, we are usually, as Richard said, we are usually, uh, we have uh, extra prosthetic extension with a radial extension somewhere in the order of, you know, uh, under 1.5 millimetres. Yep. That would be 90% or under 1.5 millimetres. Yeah. Yep. The other thing I'd say about PSA recurrence, um, now the early recurrence, like in this patient, uh, they're likely to be lymph nodes or bones, but in the patient who recurs PSA a couple of years down the track, a, a local recurrence kind of picture, MR is much better than PET. And the reason it's much better than PET is because we've got the isobis excreted into the bladder and we really can't see it for it. You can't see the anastomosis very well at all. Yep. So the anastomosis is either in the middle, the recurrence is either in the midline uh, at the anastomosis uh, where MR is very good or it's in the, the uh, seminal visceral bed where uh, they're both about the same. So if you thought there was a local recurrence picture, then I suggest you should do an MR. Yep. If you think it's a bone or nodal uh, recurrence, you should do PET. And if it's local recurrence, it's the contrast enhanced in, uh, series that is best for that. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. 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 Okay. No, that's it, okay. They often no, there's often no mass on T2. There's often no restricted diffusion. You only see it on the, on the DCM. Yep. Okay. 
Terrific. Um, now we do have one more case. So if, if people are happy to, to break our own rules and just quickly go through the last one, because it is a, a, a really nice way to just sort of uh, finish off the messaging um, about how to read these prostate MRIs. Um, it's not subtle, it's fairly obvious this one, but um, hopefully it really drives the message home. And Richard, you've got it up already, that case four? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, loading in a way we can look at it. Uh, so, so just a step. A bit of clinical background, 73 year old man, so a little bit older, um, PSA 9.1, repeated 9.9. .9. Uh, we got uh, an MRI and um, Richard, what have you got there? Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm sharing, so you can see that now, can't you? Uh, so, uh, so again, small prostate, 23cc, and you can see that he said a previous TRP here. You can see the TRP cavity. Mm. Um, so, if we if we link the uh, images again, uh, and as we go from uh, base to apex, you can see uh, we've got marked restricted diffusion with a uh, decreasing intensity on ADC, increasing intensity, intensity on IB value. Uh, and focal decrease in intensity, but it's quite homogeneous and it's relatively well defined. Uh, if we look at that on the sagittal, it's relatively well defined. As we keep on going, more inferior, it's dropped out again. So it's it's got a margin to it, but there's marked restricted marked restricted diffusion. And then we see, I'll just relink them. Sometimes it drops out like Chris has there. Uh, so as we keep on going, it really the, the, the anterior lesion, the transition zone is from base to apex, and there's a second lesion uh, in the peripheral zone, posterolateral and posteromedial peripheral zone, uh, going from the mid prostate uh, to the uh, right to the apex. Here again, it's decreased tension on ADC, increased tension on high B value diffusion imaging. So if you're still not sure about this one, which is relatively well defined, so almost a pyrads two, based on pyrads classification. Uh, again, if you this shape is wrong, and if you look at this on the sagittal diffusion imaging, again the shape is wrong. It's not round or oval. It's irregular. Uh, so this is the easy one, the uh, the one in the peripheral zone, because the diffusion is the dominant sequence in the peripheral zone. But uh, this I'm very confident this is another pyrates five lesion. The anterior lesion we've got measured 1.7 centimeters. The posterior lesion at 1.5 centimeters. Now, if we look at the extra capsule extension, there is a capsular bulge here on the anterior lesion, which is suspicious. Um, and here, it, it abuts the capsule. If I measure that out, it abuts the capsule by 1.4 centimeters or thereabouts. So, but I can't really, the capsule still looks in continuity and different to the previous patient, there's no mass. Mm. So I'd be, I'd be concerned because it abuts the capsule by over more than a centimeter, almost a centimeter and a half, but, mm. but I can't definitely see a mass in the patient. So it's interesting. I mean, these two lesions look very similar. I mean, you can see them both on those single shots there. Um, and yet one's in the peripheral zone and one's in the transition zone. Yep. So um, I just thought that was an interesting uh, point to note as well, because they can look very similar, even though they're in two totally separate parts of the prostate. And Pyridge would say the, the, the diffusion is not very useful in the peripheral, in the transition zone. I, right. I disagree with that. I think it's extremely useful in the transition zone. Yes. However, it's not the dominant sequence, is it? It's not the dominant sequence. No. Yep. 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 Okay. Um, all right. So uh, this patient went on to have a biopsy um, with targeting of those lesions plus template. Uh, Andrew should have those. Yeah. So he's got uh, got disease in the the template biopsies as well as both target biopsies. One was the anterior target, three plus four, forty percent, and the second one posterior target with a high percentage pattern four into a grade group three. Um, each of them four or five millimetres, and then the, the um, more anterior ones, uh, tiny little focus that right anterior um, with higher pattern, uh, Gleason pattern four, and then bigger sampling on that right mid. Yep. So this patient on the strength of that did have a PSMA PET. I won't show that now because uh, we're running out of time, but um, that showed no evidence of metastatic disease. So we went on and did a radical. And that corresponds beautifully to what Richard said. He's got this right uh, posterior lateral lesion that extends from the apex up to the mid gland, and then a second um, non-index lesion in the anterior um, aspect of the the right lobe, but also extending onto the into the left lobe and other additional foci in the the left apex as well. Yep, that's a parasagittal of that right apical lesion. Um, 
these were graded as three plus four on that right. So a little bit of a downgrade from the four plus three, uh, 60%. Mm -hmm. And interesting that that four plus four, I think you got in the right anterior. I think that's the spurious result because I think it was, it was 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 millimetres. So we've obviously just touched um, something and only sampled the four of part of this. Yep. Uh, and then smaller, um, lower grade, three plus four and three plus three and those other more anterior zones. Yep. Again, you did lymph nodes, obviously, from the four plus three and at the higher grade group, um, but they were negative. Negative, yeah. Yeah, and an extra prosthetic you know, extension present in that, in that posterior lateral, but not anteriorly. I think the, you know, the correlation, as you mentioned, is just so precise. Now, when I say that, we're factoring in, of course, that the tumour does tend to be bigger uh, in real life than it looks like on the MRI. But, but in terms of location generally, um, it really is fantastic, which is why our MDTs have become so useful um, in terms of providing this feedback. And then of course, you know, uh, using the MRI Pro program as well um, to provide that instant feedback for, for learning has just been invaluable, uh, at least we found in our MDTs. Roberto, as we, as we wind up this session, um, have you got any advice for the trainees out there in terms of um, what you think they should be doing uh, or what they can do? I mean, obviously it's up to us as their supervisors and teachers to do our role, but is there anything you would suggest to them in this space? Yes. My, my suggestions come from uh, uh, reading an interesting paper just released on BJU International by Tristan Barrett mm -hmm. on certification on uh, reporting MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, they define three level of uh, uh, certification, level one, level two, level three. Level three is only for uh, consultant radiologists, but uh, my message is then every single urologist doing prostate biopsy need to arrive to a level two certification that needs uh, some uh, MRI course uh, to, to, to do during the last three years, to do uh, MTT meeting, to do an audit on, uh, on, uh, on uh, prostate MRI. And uh, the best is to have the fantastic picture from Andrew. Uh, and I think, uh, if you if you reach the level two certification in reading and interpret MRI, I believe that uh, our accuracy in process biopsy will be the best, and uh, we can offer a best treatment to our patients. So my uh, uh, invite to invitation to the trainees is to uh, use a lot of learning new opportunities. Uh, one is the MRI Pro in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, acquiring and increase the skill in, uh, in, uh, in reading and interpret MRI in order to best do the, 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 their commitment that is the prostate biopsy. Yep, 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 no, that's right. And so, you're, so are you suggesting certification for urologists or urologists or urology trainees as well as radiologists? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I discussed with uh, with uh, with uh, Tristan, and uh, I uh, they are uh, in uh, in uh, discussing the opportunity to have an examination to obtain the level two certification at the moment. Yeah. They are, uh, but uh, probably uh, it will be a good way to reach the, the level two certification. I yeah. think is the, the best way is to 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 reach the certification is to have a, an, an examination on reading and interpret MRI. Yep, yep, yep. Well, I suppose for, one thing- For urologists, we, for urologists. Yeah, well, I suppose that's an advantage. The way we um, created MRI Pro, the, the, the online program was specifically so that you could measure your own level of accuracy. And, and that's, that's you, you, people who go to the website after this will see that um, you have a progress tracker. So you can actually see which ones you're getting right, which ones you're getting wrong, where you're going wrong in, in terms of calling it pyrads two versus four or five, et cetera. Um, and so hopefully, you know, we're, we're very hopeful that it, it can be useful, not just for training, but, but potentially quality assurance as well, because it's an actual measure. It's not just like turning up to a workshop, you get your certificate, you go away. No one really knows whether you're any good or not, even after that. You've made an effort, which is great, but you haven't really been measured accurately. So I know it's a controversial area, Richard, have you got any comments about that? Yeah, no, um, I, I think it's a really good idea. Um, uh, the government's reimbursed for prostate MRI for about the last two years. And uh, we tried as a college to bring in a certification. In fact, MRI would have been the perfect one to, 
once, you, once you've done a certain number of cases at a certain level, would have been the perfect way to uh, have accreditation. But it uh, didn't get approved. So yep. we missed a chance there. Um, yep. Uh, so, but I agree with you. It's not easy, and it takes quite a long time, and you and you and you need accreditation. I agree. Yep. Now, um, we have gone way over time, so I apologise for that. But it's been such a fantastically interesting session, and we've had so many uh, attendees online. Francesco, have you got any other comments you'd like to make just before we close? Yeah, of course. I want to thank you all for this really great opportunity. It was really fantastic to be able to, to attend today. And it's really a great opportunity, I guess, for all residents. I totally agree with Roberto. Um, I am Italian, but I spent three years of my training in UK, in Sheffield. So I'm uh, really close to the UK system uh, to get training and to certify training. And this, I think it's really necessary for a resident to have a guide, to have a mentorship and overall, to have a feedback of what you're doing. And uh, I'm sure that the MRI Pro is the perfect way to get all these aspects together. So something that can help you to give you, um, you know, knowledge uh, to have uh, uh, confidence. So I, I invite everyone is uh, listening and is, is connect to give a look to the MRI Pro course because I well, saw it and it's amazing. Thank you, Francesco. Well, just on that, and then this is, I want to um, finish on this note, I suppose, because um, it's important. Um, people who have attended today will have had in the invitation that, um, you know, there are two forms of MRI Pro, and I mentioned at the beginning of the session, there's the 300 case program, um, but there's also MRI Sprint, which is just the 30 cases, but all of them, again, backed up with the pathology. And um, anyone who um, has attended this webinar today um, it can access the MRI Sprint uh, for free. Um, and they'll be able to do that because um, by registering and attending this webinar, we um, have got, we will send you the email um, that will give you the uh, coupon code uh, to allow you to access uh, MRI Sprint without cost. So um, we hope that you'll find that uh, anyone who's listening extremely useful. Um, we'll be able to send that out in the next uh, two or three days. Uh, being the weekend at the moment, but um, we'll get that out soon. And um, we'll be delighted to hear any feedback that you may have uh, on that. And, and we hope it's extremely use useful. Roberto and Francesco, I would love to do this again one day because uh, it's just been fantastic. Um, I really appreciate you taking the your time out of, and more than an hour, nearly an hour and a half now, out of your Saturday morning. Um, and once again, Richard and Andrew, thank you for your persistent, consistent uh, support. Uh, of all this teaching that we're doing. Um, we hope it's very valuable for all those who are joining and um, thank you all for attending tonight's or today's session. Thanks for inviting me, Jeremy, and great to meet you guys. Thank you. Jeremy. Thank you so much. I Take just care. want to give you a direct feedback that just now they are writing the residents from the ESRU, so from European group on our chat, and they are really enthusiastic and want to thank you for oh. this really fantastic webinar. So live people are enthusiastic for today. Thanks really a lot. Right. Thanks, Francesco. And don't forget to fill out the survey. Um, anyone who's, who's still listening, yes, if absolutely. you haven't done it already, uh, please go to the email that you've been sent and, um, and complete the survey. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so Bye -bye. much. Bye. Bye-bye.